So it's my great pleasure to welcome Michael Lopp. One moment, please. There are props. All right. The rule is in presentations that you hit play in keynote. Perfect. The rule is um, the amount of props you have exponentially increases the chances that something's going to go horribly wrong. So um, I do have a prop. Hopefully things aren't going to go horribly wrong. The corollary to that rule is actually if you actually say that rule, things can go even worse. So fingers are crossed here. Good morning. Um, my name is Michael Lopp. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I got a little teary over there. Um, I am, um, as was already said, I write, if you know me, you probably know me as Rands. Rands and Repose is the blog that I write about, I write on. <clears throat> the nerd handbook is one of the things, one of the topics I worry about, which is nerds and, and geeks. The nerd handbook is an article I wrote for the significant others of nerds and geeks. It was an operating manual for how you are, who you are. Um, other things I worry about um, are about software, people management, and what to do when you're screwed. This is another article I wrote that Joel Spolsky was very kind to publish. Lastly, this is the current worry area. I'm worrying a lot about careers of, of nerds and geeks, especially in these tight times. So I'm thinking a lot about and writing a lot about, are we thinking about our jobs? Are we thinking about our careers? So this is one article I wrote about um, how we actually read resumes in the Valley. As was mentioned, I wrote a book called Managing Humans. And as might have been mentioned, I don't know, I, um, I'm writing another book for O'Reilly called um, Being Geek. This is a career handbook for nerds and is Mary here, my editor? Hope not. Anyway, um, it's uh, going to be out this winter. So that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about software and have a drink of water. I got to admit, I have a selfish agenda, and it's underneath this bot, this scarf right here. This is where I wanted to build a presentation around. And I ended up with this title, which is kind of a joke, because how do you talk about software really quickly in 15 minutes? Um, but I really wanted to talk about what's under this, um, under this scarf here. The um, conferences, the point of conferences is that we sit here and you look at the agenda and there's these amazing people and these bright people and these keynotes and these presentations and all of these great ideas. But what we do here is we spend a lot of time describing the now and we describe things, how they're going to be in the future. And this is a great thing to do. And it's a lot of fun. And then we go and we drink 17 beers with bright people and we network and we do all these fascinating things. And that's great. But what I want to do today is I want to take a little bit work, look backward. I want to reminisce about where we were and um, see if there's any lessons that we can find inside of that. Today, as I was doing research in, um, for this presentation, I learned that somewhere in the Silicon Valley today, July 22nd today, so um, there's a boardroom, and it's full of board members, and they're talking about this company. How many of you know Borland? Show of hands. Really? Interesting. Borland, I used to be at Borland many, many, many years ago. And the way that I think of Borland, if you don't know about Borland, is back in the early 90s, Borland was a competitor with Microsoft. What? Wow. We had, we we, we had two major product lines that we competed with. We had developer tools and we had an emerging office suite. And today, I'm going to be talking a little about Borland, and it's fascinating to me that they're talking about selling the company for about $100 million to a company I've never heard of in Europe called Microfocus. <clears throat> so this is an alternative title for this presentation, which is Rest in Peace, Borland. If you've ever been acquired, if you've ever been um, merged, you know that this is the end of it. It's a little bit sad, but there's some lessons inside of here, and one of them is under here. So, pop quiz. Anyone remember to know what the product that had this tagline? Finally, a relational database everyone can use. There's only two products that we did at Borland. You can probably guess it. The product, um, the product is upside down. Oh, that's total demo faux pas. Is Paradox for Windows. If you can't see the stage, that's a picture of Paradox for Windows on my floor at home. <clears throat> and 
And I've had this box for 17 years. It's been following me around, and it's, um, I, I, I really want to open the box. That's in, <laughs> I want to see what's inside of here, because I think there's some lessons in here. This is a time capsule. There's something inside of here that we're going to discover. I'm not sure exactly what it is. If you can't see it, it says this is uh, 38. This is the 38th copy of Paradox for Windows 1.0 that came off the line. Um, before we go and actually open the box, I want to give you a little bit of a reset. The product came out in 1992. Um, I've been wondering if I'm going to ask this question. How many of you were alive in 1992? And not alive in 1992? Okay, amongst friends. Phew, I was worried. <laughs> okay, very good. So these are all going to be very relevant to you. There were some interesting things going on in 1992. I went to Wikipedia, I looked at the 1992 page, and I looked and said, okay, what are the things that are going to bring me back there? So um, something that was going on in 1992, Hannibal Lecter was scaring the crap out of us while also getting a couple of Academy Awards for Silence of the Lambs. This guy was running the show. We know how that went. Um, for you sci-fi folks, the Hal 9000 in 1992 actually came online. Sticking with the sci-fi theme, uh, Khan. Khan actually was, if you're a Star Trek person, was rising to power at this time. Now, I swear to God, I picked these things just looking down the list, kind of going, hmm, what was 1992 like? But I only had one that I actually needed to have on here. And as I put them all together, I see an interesting story. I was driving home after I'd done this slide going, Hannibal Lecter, Hal, Khan, Windows 3.1. Anyway, they were not intended to be this thing, this, this list of things which are maybe misunderstood, not evil, I'm not sure what's going on here. But 90, 1992 was when Windows 3.1 came out. And um, Borland had a big bet on Windows. We were doing all of our products as part of, of Windows. And that is when we're going to open the box. Because I really want to know what's going on in here. So for those of you who don't know, this is a complete database application. Oh, cool, the sticker's attached. Good, all right. Um, this is a complete database application, desktop database application. And I um, wonder how it opens. Oh, interesting. Meaning everything's in here. This isn't my SQL when you just have a database. It's everything. It's the, it's the, it's the database layer. It's the IDE in front of it. We had this language called ObjectPal called uh, PAL, Paradox Application Language, which, um, which uh, was great. Oh, you can get it for 1995, 99.95, Quattro Pro, another winning product. Anyway, what do we have inside of here? We have, this box is really, really heavy. For any of you who've bought video games, the, the test for video games used to be this. It used to be you go into the store and you pick up the box and you go, is it heavy? And if it's heavy, it's cool because, you know, there's swag in there, right? So Paradox currently passes the test for swag quite well. There's a huge amount of documentation in here. What the heck's going on here? Pre-internet. If you had a question, your solution was to go to CompuServe or AOL. Where are the disks? There's no disks in here. Is this a big joke they've been playing on me for 17 years? There's literally no disks in here. That's fascinating. Oh, there they are. Whew. I was panicking. Philippe Kahn's laughing. Ha ha, I'm going to give the developers boxes with no disks. Um, anyway, so 1992, pre-internet. The documentation wasn't, around, wasn't online. It was sitting here in all of these books. You had to go and um, read them. Go for the figure. Four three and a half inch floppies. So 1.44, so do the math there, so let's call it seven megabytes. Seven megabytes for this entire application I just described to you. This keynote presentation that I'm showing you is about 15 megabytes. <laughs> what in the world are we doing with all of this space is my first thought. As you continue to go out on the list of requirements for Paradox for Windows, four disks, I had it at seven. Anyway. Um, the requirements are really interesting. Uh, personal computer, I386 or higher, Windows 3.1, hard drive, one floppy drive. I didn't even know when floppy drives left. I was like, suddenly they weren't there, and I didn't care. I just got a machine that didn't have one, I never noticed. EGA, VGA, or other high resolutions displays. Uh, a mouse, interesting they called that out. But here's another really interesting requirement. Four megabytes or six megabytes, four megabytes required, six megabytes recommended. Here's the deal. Um, this is marketing spin. You probably needed about 10 megabytes. 10 megabytes? Show of hands. 
How many of you have 32 gigabytes of storage, or 32 megabytes of storage touching your skin right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are we doing with all this space? What is going on here? As you go and you've seen these graphs before, where's my clicker? There it is. As you look at these graphs, this is the cost of megabyte, megabyte per, a dollar per, me cost per megabyte going from around two, $300 for hard drive down to about uh, five cents. This is shocking to me. And memory, this is a logarithmic graph. Um, memory is exactly the same story. You just sit here looking at it in 81. This is a bit wider of a range from 81 until around, I think around 2000, going from $10,000 down to, um, wow, I have five minutes left. I've got to speed it up. Um, down to a uh, dollar, and it's come down a lot since then. My question to us as I speed things up now is are we getting lazy? Are we putting ourselves in technical debt? Because we're sitting here thinking, why in the world would I clean up the code when CPUs are going to be 10 percent faster next year? Why in the world would I care about the footprint of my application or my OS when drive space is practically free? We're putting it in the cloud. Yay! There's lots of good reasons to do this, but I don't think we're even getting to these decisions. My first thought is that I think we're surrounded by very well-intentioned forces of evil, as I like to call them. These are wonderful people, and I depend on them every single day, but they generally screw me up. These people, as I go race through this, here's um, Laura, she's our program manager, and what she tells you is, hit the schedule. You just gotta hit the schedule. Don't worry about it, we'll get it in an update. Then we've got um, designer, Mark. Mark, what he can do in Photoshop is incredibly amazing. And what Mark says to me, in his evil voice, is don't worry about it. This is how it, it's going to be better like this. And he has no idea what it's going to cost, which is good. And you got the CEO, and his variety of tricks are just mind-bendingly complex. What this guy says really pisses me off. He says, don't worry about it. Yes, we want all the features. We want the quality. You've got to hit the date. It's OK. Don't worry about it. We're going to throw away the 1.0, and we'll just start over again. That never happens. And lastly, we've got the customers. <clears throat> the customers say we love these guys, but they drive us up the wall because what they tell us is this. They say, hey, um, if it were only this feature, I'd use your product. And there's a million of these people out here. And they're dragging us in all these different places when all we want to do is code. All we want to do is code, damn it. Development is a series of decisions, and there's two buckets of decisions. There's a the big, huge ones. How much are we going to charge for it? What are we going to do uh, about this storage thing? What is the strategy? What is the marketing strategy around it? These are big, huge decisions. I don't want to talk about these decisions because I want to talk about the smaller ones that we're all making quietly in our office. And these are small little decisions that you don't vet with anyone. And you make a huge amount of these every day. And I think there's a balance of your work are these decisions. And they're incredibly impactful, even though they don't feel major because there's not a wiki page describing what the heck you're thinking. <clears throat> we are, we are craftspeople, is my thought. All of these well-intentioned forces of evil around us, they are trying to alter our perspective. Software is our craft. It's our art. We are building, we are building our best when we're building for ourselves, and never more so, in my opinion, inside of open source. So how did it go at Borland? Jumping, jumping back here really quick before we talk about decisions. How did it go? It didn't go well. This is the stock price. Went from 80 and 91, and it's been kind of hovering around $10, and we know what's happening there. Why did it get sold? It got, Paradox got sold in sometime in the middle of uh, the 90s to Corel. It's still around. There's a couple of cautionary tales in here. There's a couple of big decisions that happened as part, of, as part of the decline of Borland. The time to market, Microsoft Access, beat us out of the gate by several months. And in my opinion, it was a lower quality product, but it grabbed the mind share. This was the office wars at the time. And we never really recovered from the fact that they were out the gate first. <laughs> there was no migration path for Paradox DOS users to Paradox Windows users. So you got a combined new product on the line, and what we were thinking was all of our developers would happily drop all of the work they'd invested and come redevelop their application on sort of Windows, which sounds absurd. It sounds absolutely absurd, but never underestimate the, for, the power of the uh, well-intentioned force of evil. Lastly, we had a pricing disaster. 149, what was it? What does the box say? Something like that. 
Question, what's a higher number, 140 or 100? 140 is. <clears throat> the re I've never been on a pricing committee. I know this is an incredibly hard, complex problem. There was a huge amount of work deciding at Borland to put it in at $140 against ac access, which is around $99, I believe. And it's insane. It was this huge, big decision that they said, okay, we're gonna be more profitable here, but we'll sell less. But at the end of the day, it was more, and people went for the cheaper one. We are craftspeople. The ones with the problems that we just had on the prior slide were the big decisions. And I don't want you to worry about the big decisions. I want you to worry about the little decisions. Yes, you've got to wear many hats to get a product out the door. Yes, you've got to deal with these well-intentioned forces of evil around you, but your job is the code. Your art is the code. It's muddled by many, but owned by you. The best part of being a developer is that you own the bits. The buck stops there. That's a very empowering place to be, and I want your head to be in that space when you're thinking about how you're developing software. And again, I think this is something in open source is, is never more obvious than in open source, where developers freely give of themselves to the code. The history of software is a history of decisions. There's the big ones that maybe we can influence and maybe we can't. And then there's all the little ones. It's the little tiny ones, the ones you're gonna make today at four o'clock. Who knows what they're gonna My question is, are you making those decisions, are you making those decisions for a well-intentioned force of evil or for yourself? My question is, are you building for now or are you building for the future? My question is, are you reacting as you're doing this work? Or are you being proactive in sort of this work? In sort of this work? The world is full of bright and shiny things. There's Twitter is telling me about all these amazing things that are going on all the time. And it's, up, it's wonderful as a person with nerd attention deficiency disorder who just loves to consume information. <clears throat> but the point is, all of this new is not that interesting to me. What's interesting to me is what is good. The best compliment I could find when I was staring at um, doing research for this was there's still a development community around Paradox Windows. Paradox 4X it works for Corel. I don't know what they're doing anymore. But they're still there. There was something that was good in that product that allowed them to actually sit here 17 years later and actually still use the product. And my question is, my thought is, I think to make a good product, you have to make the big decisions right. But I also think the little decisions matter a lot as well. I don't know what those are. They're small, but they're combined, I think, to have a huge impact on developing good product. So, Rest in peace, Borland. I wish the people well there. I still have people that are still there. It's kind of sad, but um, the thought I want to leave you with is big decisions, little decisions, good decisions, bad decisions. These are all interesting failures and successes, and we get to learn from them all. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.